everyone, Jesse from Bear Flower Farm. I am so excited for this video because if you've been following me for any period of time, you probably have heard of me reference my grower friend, Jess. Well, today you finally get to meet her because I had the opportunity to interview her at her day job, which is at Cross Country Nurseries in Kingswood, New Jersey. And that sits basically on the border of uh, New Jersey and Pennsylvania in like central western New Jersey. So that this greenhouse predominantly does tomato and pepper live plants. They sell a ton of varieties of these types of plants in the spring. This time of year, they harvest peppers to also sell online, but they this year decided to dip their toes into perennials and they did a lot of perennials for cut flowers. So we toured the greenhouse. We also talk about what it's like to grow these perennials in a more commercial type of setting. Now, this is a relatively smaller type of greenhouse, meaning there's not a ton of machinery. There's still a lot of people doing the stuff like seeding, uh, planting, watering, all that stuff. But we go behind the scenes and Jess takes us on a tour of all of this. So besides the fact that I thought it would be interesting for all of us to get a behind the scenes peek on what it's like to grow in this type of commercial setting, the other thing is it is October 7th. So for this weekend and the next weekend, they are still shipping their perennials. Uh, so if you live in the United States, they will ship to you. And if you live in New Jersey, you can go to this location. I'll put the address right up here. Uh, and if you go to that location, obviously you get to skip the shipping costs. So Jess is gonna show you what these plugs or they're not even plugs they are really transplants what they look like so the thing that I do want to call out here and I'll address a little bit more at the end of the video is their main consumer base is the average consumer so these are people who are buying tomatoes and peppers for either their personal culinary use or putting them out into the garden um, these are typically people who are also looking for very special type of varieties in that category I say this because their perennials are not priced in a way that we are used to as flower farmers. So meaning that it is a little bit more expensive than what you normally would be expecting, especially if you're buying from plugs. But it is still something to consider if you're one, a smaller scale grower, because most of us don't need a tray of 200 yaro. Where are you gonna put that? Uh, so if you're someone very small scale, this could be a good opportunity for you to buy like six or 12 of something mixing and matching different types of perennials. So I think they have like 50 to 70 varieties to choose from, there's a lot. Uh, it could also be good for you if you never got a chance to start seed for overwintering and you want to. So a lot of the perennials that they sell are hardy down to zone three. So if you didn't get a chance to start anything from seed during the summer, this could be a good opportunity for you to get a few plants to overwinter and see how they do. So I'm gonna stop talking and I'm gonna get straight to the interview and then I'm gonna wrap up the interview talking about uh, how you could buy these plants and if you were to buy plants, uh, the ones that I would potentially focus on to get you a good ROI since that price is a little bit higher than what you and I would normally buy to resale for cut flowers. Hey, I'm grower friend Jess and this is my day job, a pepper farm. We also grow tomatoes and this year, perennials. So I have been growing since uh, 2010 and I've been growing vegetables since then. And then I started doing flowers about three years ago and I just really enjoy the whole nurturing process of flowers. I grow on about a quarter acre pretty extensively. I sell to florists. I do like DIY wedding buckets. I just did my last one this morning actually, so I'm happy to call it a wrap. Um, I sell plugs to Jesse. I've definitely scaled back on that. Um, and I wanted to learn more about what happens commercially. And so that's how I landed here. So when Tom came to me this year, the owner, and he said that he wanted to do some perennials, I was really excited because coming from Cut Flowers, I really wanted to integrate 
multi-purpose varieties. So you will see a lot of that in here. We only did about 60 or 70 varieties this year, which sounds like a lot, but really, um, you know, it's only a greenhouse worth. So here we are in Kingwood Township, New Jersey. We are, it's part agriculture. It's also part e-commerce. It's a very interesting farm to grow all of these things, to ship all of these things. We have a hot shop that is open on weekends, but it's only seasonal in the spring and in the fall. Um, so basically everything that we grow gets shipped. So we have, like I said, 11 greenhouses, but greenhouse 11 is where all of the planting happens. We have a separate farmhouse where all of the seeding takes place in the basement. And that starts in, I'd say January and December, January. And then all those little babies come up in five, 12 plugs and they come in here. We have the heat mats on. And what we do is mix the soil right here and this year we started incorporating some earthworm castings, which is how I always grow at my house. And the plugs that I sell to Jesse always get earthworm castings and they also get mycos because I just, I'm a firm believer that like everything happens at the root system, right? What is mycos? Can you explain for people who don't know? Yeah. So it's mycorrhizal fungi and it's a really great thing to inoculate your soil with because it has a really... Um, is going to sound ridiculous. I say it's romantic, but in times of drought, this fungus will actually sacrifice itself, sacrifice its water to your plant's new, uh, root system. <laughs> so some places you can actually get earthworm castings that already have uh, mycos within it. So you don't have to worry about mixing it so much. You can also buy mycos itself. You can mix it in, you know, per cup, whatever, however big your, your planting station is, and just make sure that everything's thoroughly mixed, everything's wetted, and then you can go ahead and we fill our pots. This is how we pop out our 512s, obviously. And then they go, let's just pretend like this is all wet. And they go in here, we press this down, and then we have a whole crew of people working along this planting table. We pop in our plugs, cover them up. They go on the heat trays and everything gets watered again. And this whole greenhouse fills up uh, in about three days. So what I was excited to do this year was put the perennials in the same pots that we grow our tomatoes and our peppers in because I just feel like obviously you're going to have a better root system in a two and a half, two and a half, three, and um, you're just not really going to get that with plugs. Farmer Bailey is amazing. I'm not thrown to shade at all, <laughs> but for smaller scale growers that just need a little bit of something and they have a small space, why not start out with a really great root system and a really great plant that will not take as long to get established in the ground. And then another thing that we do is we also inoculate with fish fertilizer right here in the greenhouse. So everything is getting plant food from the sea. It's all organic. It's all happening. <laughs> so everything comes inoculated. It comes fertilized. You got the mycos. And then everything, once this greenhouse is full, it seems a little crazy, but we move it to another greenhouse and then we do it all over again. So we fill up 11, we move it, we usually put, you know, um, different heat levels of peppers into different greenhouses. You have tomato greenhouses and whatnot. And then once that all happens and things are grown out and ready to ship, we move to greenhouse 10 where we stage everything each week by orders. And Tom has this really great system where we um, get QR codes, we scan right here, and it tells you how many plants you need to pick, what state it's going to, and we go ahead and we're just, I think I took uh, 21,000 steps one day picking. Yeah, just back and forth. <laughs> 
and we have packers, there's boxes everywhere. It's, it's madness, but it only lasts for uh, about two months shipping lasts for. Um, so this is just an example of a perennial order, uh, just a box of six. So this person has some Pentstemon, they have some Bee Balm, you know, I guess the Leatris here and some Fox Club. So this is how it will come shipped to you and nothing, nothing comes out. <laughs> and it gets packed up right here in a box, live plants this way up. And this is also how we ship the uh, peppers and the tomatoes. Same system, same box. We do sixes, twelves, eighteens, and twenty-fours. So everything is in groups of six. And hence the name Cross Country Nurseries. We ship everything across the country. And here we grow everything in a peat-based formula, which is why we add everything that we do. The fish fertilizers, the mycos. The earthworm castings. We just kind of want to feed the plants. We want to make sure they're healthy. We want to make sure that we're not giving you anything with disease. Keep it as clean as possible. Okay. So a lot of these perennials uh, will be good down to zone three. However, we're here in New Jersey. I live locally next to Jesse and I overwinter stuff that is a seven, no problem year after year. So over here we have some yarrow, which is called marshmallow, and it's beautiful. It's a double, it's plumy, it's 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 just gorgeous. I think it would be really great in event work. We have your typical yarrows. We have some balloon flower, which is on the shorter side, but I do hear that it makes a fantastic cut flower. You just have to sear the stems so that the sap doesn't go. We have uh, Cherokee Sunset Rutabecchia. This here is a type of bee balm. It is multi-purpose, so you can go ahead and you can use it for edible flowers, you can use it for cut flowers. A lot of this stuff in here, I would say, would add a lot of whimsy and like fireworks to your bouquets if you're doing your typical dahlias, if you're doing your typical zinnias. You know, you kind of have those ball-like forms already, so this will just be little spikes, little fireworks, lots of fun, mountain mint, always <laughs> fox glove this is the digitalis foxy it's great it overwinters it self seeds this one is apricot variety and this one will come back it's a short-lived perennial but yes it is a perennial and over here we have for bescom the vase life isn't wonderful, but it blooms when nothing else does. So when your alliums are coming out, your verbescum's coming out, that is super early May. It at least provides you with something. I think it actually helped you a lot this uh, spring. So over here we have sea holly. This is the white glitter. This one just keeps coming and coming and coming. As long as you cut it back early, you're gonna have a ton of stems. This is Spotted Bee Balm. Bee Balm does get your powdery mildew, but if you just kind of keep on top of it, keep cutting, it'll keep coming back. Harvest it at the right time. This is Fama Scabiosa, the pincushion, and it gives you, I don't know, three or four inch flowers. It comes in blue, it comes in white. Uh, I think 10 to 15 stems once it gets established. You know, the thing with these perennials is it's kind of like, it's the long game, right? It's a little sleep creep leap, but these things are gonna be good for you. You're gonna get lots of stems. Um, more rutabecchias. We have double daisy rutabecchias. We have um, Indian summer rutabecchia, which I think I sold to Jesse this, uh, spring and she wound up having to chop it. Chelsea chop it, didn't you? Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, and then we have Penstemum. You can also use that as a cut. This, oh, this little baby right here, this is the um, purple sheen sea holly. So it's a larger um, like thick thistle head and it's purple and it's beautiful. Over here we have more Penstemum. We have some Delphinium. Solidago, I know it's technically a wildflower, but this one is um, a dwarf variety, so it only gets about two feet tall and it's clumping. So if you just kind of want to have a little bit of fall in your bouquets, a little bit of golden colors, because you're still rocking your coral zinnias late summer, 
that'll give it to you. This is Econops Blue Nitro. Um, oh, this is a type of Shasta Daisy, I believe. Yeah, so we have different Shasta Daisies as well. We have ones that are like doubles. Um, these make okay cuts. You know, white flowers, they can get a little muddy. They can get a little dirty. Look at that giant spider. Oh my God, squirrel. Okay, uh, more Econops. We have the white ones. We have the blue ones. Um, we have more Rudabecchias. Uh, we have more <laughs> Foxglove. And then we also have uh, Liatris back there, which it's, it does make a cute cut. It's a spike. Again, it'll add your whimsy. Um, it'll double. You can, it'll become clumps. You can separate it, divide it. It comes in corms, so you can share them with friends eventually over the years. Um, but yeah, all of these things, perennials, the gift that keeps giving, so. Everything that you do see in this greenhouse has been seeded in July, August, and that's about three, four months now. And we are not automated at all. So there is a lot of labor and love that goes into this. Everything is hand watered. Everything is hand planted. Everything is hand seeded. So also these bigger pots, it's not your typical plug trays. You're just gonna get established faster. This is a still be really cute, like Celosia. I don't know, I am doing the math. There's thousands, there's, there's thousands of plants in here. <laughs> okay, so once you receive these at home, what you're gonna wanna do is make sure you have at least six weeks to get them established before your first frost. Everybody knows Lisa Mason Ziegler's cool flower book, reference it if you got it. Um, certain perennials, the ones down to zone three, you have a little bit more time with them, but the things that are like sevens and whatnot, just give them a little bit of love. Also, if you're a colder, maybe you might want to do a little bit of frost cloth as well, just until they can get established. But I know where I am. I overwinter my Lombata Minarda, which is a zone seven, and I'm technically zone six here, and it's no problem whatsoever. I don't even put a frost cloth on it. What are flowers that are down to like zone, I guess, five, four, three, that you don't necessarily need the, or there's more wiggle room right now in terms of time? Hmm, let's say that would be your Econops. That would be, I would even say certain varieties of Rutabecchia you're gonna be fine with. They're so hardy. Uh, your Snapdragons, go ahead. Um, Mountain Mint, that's good. Um, Yarrow, you're good there. Um, Bee Balm, go for it. <laughs> even though that's zone seven. Is Bee Balm? Minarda. Yeah, but not uh, not all of our bee bombs is Lombata. Oh, okay, got it. So let's see here, spotted bee bomb. Yeah, hardiness down to three. Oh. So like the spotted, yeah. So the spotted bee bomb has a hardiness down to zone three. So if you're getting the Lombata, definitely get it in ASAP. The spotted bee bomb, the other Lombata or the other Monardas, they're fine. Your sea hollies, you're good there. That has a really good hardiness. I believe those are three. Um, Penstemums will do well. Get them in. The, I, you know what? I sold you these. Do you remember I sold you lupine? I, they just, I, did, but I don't I think. Up, so it's not. <laughs> I oh. can't speak from experience. Oh, okay. Yeah. But I, I feel like. They, it's pretty hardy. It is hardy. Yeah, it is. Okay. So what? You just didn't get it in in time? Uh, I let it go a little too far out and it was already on its like, last legs. Oh. Okay. So. Yeah, that's fine. That happens. Um, this purple sheen will give you uh, a lot of time to get it in. I mean, Delphinium. The majority are. Yeah, like, yeah. Anything you would avoid at this stage if you're, zone, if you're in the high or the, the lower zone for a frost is like next couple of weeks. Oh, yeah. The verbena? Yes. Yeah. Don't okay. mess with the verbena and don't mess with the Lombata Monarda. Everything else should be just fine. And this barley right here, this is grown as part of our pest management. So this is a source for our beneficials that take care of any pest problems in here. But do you guys have a lot of pest pressure in here, especially this time of year? No, definitely not. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And just to touch a bit on peppers and tomatoes, since we are predominantly a pepper and tomato farm, I wanted to just share with you how many varieties that we grow. So we grow around like 500 varieties of peppers, I believe it is. It's absolutely insane. Um, 
There's 200 varieties of tomatoes and about 70 varieties of basil and herbs, tomatillos, you name it. So when I first came here, I couldn't believe the varieties that we had. Stuff I've never even heard of, stuff I'm still to this day trying to pronounce. And I helped um, our customer service girl the one day and I just thought it was really interesting because so many people are coming from all over to seek out peppers that maybe their grandmothers in the Caribbean used to make the curries with. And you know, oh, this is, you know, the, the pepper that my mother used in China to make this Szechuan, you know? And so if you're looking for that one-off variety that you cannot find anywhere, we have it. <clears throat> okay, and out here in the field, we have some people picking peppers because we pick every Friday and we ship every Monday fresh peppers. We grow a lot of super hots. People love that for making hot sauces, any kind of culinary purposes. We also have seed peppers in here that we do a seed saving program. And so you guys aren't just shipping live plants. You're actually shipping the fruit. Yes, we ship the fruit as well. And then what we don't ship and after we harvest it, we also dry these hot peppers. So we also sell hot pepper powders of all different kind of super hot peppers. That's pretty cool. Yeah. A you, of it's a ton of peppers. We have 30 berms of peppers. Habanero red savina, in case you really want to light it up. No, thank you. <laughs> and I think this is the most precious. Like, even look at the stem. Oh, this pepper just kills me. Are you taking the entire stem off? Yeah. Oh, okay, this is how we set. <gasps> it looks like a little lantern it's really cute i know this is a ha'ahi dulce orange have you ever tried using and it's stuff? mild well have you ever tried using the stuff in like cut flowers like the ornamental stuff oh god there's one it's called the thunder mountain longhorn and i was even saying to maggie yesterday it would be absolutely beautiful in a bouquet but the foliage actually holds up right oh you know what? i haven't tested with the foliage i know tomatoes work really well mm. so but i actually think peppers also do too because i've gotten like clips of peppers and mm. in water and eat this like, pepper or does it freak you out to eat something it's not sprayed it's not sprayed no it's not spicy oh no it's not at all all right oh yeah not and this is the area where we after we pick all of the peppers we line them up, we weigh them, just so we know how much it is that we have. The orders all come through on the computer here, and here is the Whoa. fresh, yeah, all of the fresh hot peppers, and we ship these out. And how you receive them is take a box. Oh, nice. Yeah. So these are half pint sizes. These right? are half pint sizes. So obviously the minimum order is six half pints. But if you're, you know, for culinary purposes, if you're just going to make yourself a hot sauce, you want to try a certain hot pepper, honestly, even if you just want to buy them and then save seeds for yourself next year, rock on, whatever it is that you want to do. So we fill the orders and then you have all six. We mark up here on a grid exactly what it is, and then and then you ship it out. And we ship it out. Get so, little... so you said it's like what, like thirty bucks for that entire box? Yeah, it's about thirty some bucks for uh for a box of fresh picked, super hot or seasoning I mean, these peppers. These are more like the specialty peppers that you're not going to find. Absolutely. Elsewhere, right? So if yeah. you're looking for specialty <laughs> stuff, this might actually be. 100%. A really place to, uh, to shop for, so. Absolutely. You're not going to go anywhere at a grocery store right now and find Bootjalokia greens or Trinidad seasoning peppers. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. Yeah. So here we have them, and we are going to take order. We're shipping for two more weeks. So it is time sensitive if any of you like hot peppers. <laughs> I hope that was as fun for you to listen to as it was for me to interview Jess and get that tour. Now, I did want to talk about how you could purchase these perennials if you were interested. So first thing is uh, their website. So I'm going to put their website link up here. I will say that it is a little bit, we'll call it outdated. Now, uh, Jess had 
kind of started mentioning but didn't go into detail that Tom uh, bought this business quite recently. So they're in the process of upgrading a lot of stuff, including the website. So they're actually working on a new website right now and that should go live, I would think by next year. Uh, but for the time being, the current website still achieves the objectives of someone being able to buy, they'll get that um, buying information and then they'll ship out the plugs to you. Right now they are shipping out, I believe Mondays and Tuesdays. So if you are interested, I would go online this weekend or the next weekend, which is the last weekend that they would be shipping. And of course, if you're uh, local here, so I would say like Philly area, central New Jersey, even uh, south north New Jersey, it might be worth your time to drive over. Um, and in Pennsylvania, probably Bucks County area is relatively close to uh, this greenhouse. So that's the buying piece of it. The second piece I want to talk about is the numbers piece of it, right? Because I talk about business and profitability and we'll call it $6 a plug plus shipping. It's not even a plug, it's a transplant, but $6 per plant uh, is a pretty steep price for someone who is trying to uh, cut the flower and resell it. So I think that there are certain situations where some perennials might actually make sense for that. So perennials obviously should reliably come back year after year. Certain perennials come back better than others uh, in subsequent years and certain perennials start puttering out after like year three or year four. So those are all considerations. Uh, my personal favorite this year was obviously yarrow. I got a lot out of yarrow and yarrow is one of those things where I would potentially purchase a couple of plants honestly because I had such a great harvest off of them. I was able to sell them both retail and uh, and to my florist. So for my florist, I sold them at anywhere from $1.10 to $1.30 a stem, depending on the quality and the type of flush. So I got two flushes out of them, which is really nice. And then when they uh, overwinter for the next year, uh, after producing one year, they're going to get even more vigorous and they're going to spread. So now I'm going to be able to have two plants out of that. So if you have a small space, you really want to get some yarrow for next year. I don't think it's a bad idea to spend that $6 plus shipping to put a couple of yarrow plants in, especially because they got the double. They got the marshmallow white yarrow, which I've never grown. And I think that would do really well, both retail and for florists. So yarrow would definitely be on my list. Another one that would be on my list is sea holly. Sea holly inherently is more expensive to buy as a plug. If you go to somewhere like Farmer's Bailey, you'll see that the price per tray is significantly higher than most other type of plants. Uh, and then sea holly overwinters really well it's super super hardy and it also gives you multiple stems and i've been getting continuous flushes of sea holly throughout the season it commands a much higher price so i sell sea holly for a dollar 65 a stem at my co-op and that is one of those uh flowers in bouquets that just gives you both pop and color and texture because it comes in like blue, purple, white glitter. It's just such a different flower that a lot of retail customers have never seen it. And it is something that I am definitely keeping in for overwintering. Um, the third plant I might consider, especially for landscaping, is foxglove. So all the foxglove that they, they're selling is first year flowering, meaning it does not need um, two years to vernalize and then flower. This is important because obviously you're going to be saving some time when it comes to that flowering. Now, foxglove is like sea holly and like yarrow uh, deer resistant, though honestly, I have seen deer nibble on some foxglove before, which is crazy because foxglove is actually poisonous. But foxglove makes for a great landscaping plant and you will get multiple stems off of a single foxglove. I mean, I've seen foxglove go for anywhere from like a dollar 30 to even upwards of $2, depending on the stem length and the quality of it. Uh, foxglove typically does do better under structures. It gets a lot taller under structures, which is more worthy for florists. But if you're doing retail, I mean, you don't need like two, three foot foxglove, right? In fact, that might be detrimental to bouquet making. So foxglove did really well for me planting outside here in zone 6B. I have heard that if I let it sit out there for another winter, it's gonna produce even more vigorous stems next year. So I'm gonna do that. And what that means is I would say off of a single foxglove, I got at least four to five stems this year. And if I get another four to five stems next year, you know, the plant's obviously starting to, to um, pay itself back. But I think that that would be a great plant in landscaping and of course you've got some of the other stuff like mountain mint that i would definitely definitely buy um mountain mint at six dollars each for the way that it spreads 
might be worth it. You just probably need to buy like two to three plants and over time you can take cuttings, you can propagate it, or you can just let it do its thing, but you will definitely have filler, right? So investing in a perennial filler to me is one of the best things that you can do because it's kind of like set it and forget it. And especially for something like mint, nothing touches mint from an animal perspective and it grows relatively aggressively. Now this mint, I actually did a video, so I'll link it above and below in the description, but mountain mint is not in the same family as like spearmint. So what that means is that it still spreads by rhizomes but it's not as aggressive so it's not going to take over an entire yard if you were to put it there so i would definitely also consider mountain mint if you don't have a lot of reliable fillers and i think that if i had one more that i would put my vote in it would either be rudbeckia or bee balm now rudbeckia i didn't have a great experience this year because mine got overtaken by aphids it is very hardy to overwinter. Everyone else, honestly, who I feel grows Rubeckia didn't have any of the issues that I had with aphids. So I think that was a me problem. And there are just so many different types of Rubeckia and they also grow pretty aggressively. You get a lot of stems off of one or another. You can chop them down and then they will overwinter and produce the next year again. I did that and got an abundance of stems. I mean, even though Rubeckia is one of those flowers where you're getting multiple bloom heads off of like a single central stem and you can't use all those bloom heads I would say off of a single plant you could get at least a dozen of them and Rebecca at my uh, co-op can go anywhere from like a dollar 20 to like a dollar 40 depending on the size the color the type so um, Rebecca adds up in terms of volume um, I wouldn't buy it because I just had such a bad experience this year but I think for most people that's not an issue and it does well in landscaping too uh, the other one I I would put my money on is Monarda. They grow a ton of different types of Monarda. Monarda is native to where I live in New Jersey, which is a really big consideration. But besides uh, being hardy down to zone three for some Monardas and some Monardas are hardy down in zone seven, it self reseeds really easily. So again, another great native to put out there because it will attract a lot of the beneficials. Uh, it will self reseed and then you've got a filler. And what I found out about Monarda this year was that if you pick it, at that right stage obviously you get to use it in its full form but if you wait a little too long and it's the petals start drying you can pull out the petals and it will produce a really interesting textural head that um, is just interesting in a bouquet so my two cents on all of that if i were someone who didn't have a lot of space who doesn't have anything for the spring right now i would probably invest about a hundred dollars or so into overwintering overwintering perennial so i have something for the spring and that something will divide or multiply for the spring after. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I did filming and getting to interview Jess. Now you guys finally get to see her and get to know a little bit more about her. So let me know if you have any questions in the comments below and I will see you in the next video.